Good morning, everyone. My name is Toby Fox, and I'm the Managing Director of FreeFox, the marketing agency for councils. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first Voice of Authority breakfast webinar, or as we've been calling it, Start Your Day with TVOA. And that's what you get for binge watching during lockdown. Uh, joking aside, uh, apart from my prop, um, this isn't a, a gimmicky webinar at all. All we're trying to do um, is find out if you, the audience, prefer watching earlier in the morning than the 11 a.m. slot we've been streaming on for the last 10 weeks. Uh, so do let us know. Um, there's a chat function on your screen and we'd welcome the feedback from you. And we'd also welcome your questions for our panel this morning. Um, there's a Q&A function also, and if you could use that for the questions rather than the chat, we'd be grateful. Um, it allows all the viewers to vote for which question they'd most like to hear asked and we can put the most popular ones to the panel. And what a panel. It's going to be a great pleasure to spend the next hour with these people, especially uh, a very long-standing friend and collaborator, collaborator of Thoughtbox, Chris Twigg, who is Director of Inner Circle Consulting and advisor to the London Borough of Hounslow. Morning, Chris. Uh, and also to Kevin Freeman, who is uh, coming all the way from uh, the city of Stewart in Florida. Uh, where he is Director of Counterplan and Director of Development uh, and a consumer of caffeine-containing drinks uh, at 3 a.m. this morning. Um, and to Dan Burnham, CTO and Head of Product at Souk Space, an innovative retailer who's got some really positive uh, light to throw on, uh, on recovery. And to Anthony Shapland, Head of Development Advisory at Colliers International. Good morning, Anthony. Good morning. And and to Louise Wood, Service Director for Planning at Cornwall Council. Morning, Louise. This superb lineup of UK and US local government leaders, private sector innovators and property experts, yes, that's you, panel, has been assembled to talk about the future of high streets. But everybody's talking about the future of high streets, I hear you cry. Um, and indeed, there is a lot of theory doing the rounds at the moment. But what are local government leaders actually doing and what are they doing now? Uh, this morning is about discovering practical steps that you can take now to support your high streets, your town centres, and to help your communities towards economic recovery. And in that light, let's just set the scene a bit. Anthony, we turn to you. Could you give us a little overview um, from your experience of how high streets around the country have changed over the past two or three months? What are the main elements of what's been described as five years of change in just two months? Uh, and how much of the change we're seeing is likely to endure? I will. Thank you, Toby, and good morning, everyone. Um, how have our high streets changed over the last few months? Well, we can all remember what the high streets looked like in mid-March. It wasn't that long ago. We'd just come out of one of the wettest Februarys on record, and the streets were full of people and everything was normal. We're now seeing pictures from all over the country and from around the world of empty streets. The shops are still there, the infrastructure remains, but the people have gone and the spending redistributed or put on hold. We hear every day of another retailer who's gone into administration or recording advisors to help them negotiate their rents with their landlords. Lockdown has affected us all in ways we'd never imagined. As you say, five years of change in a couple of months. For me, the speed of decline has been slightly surprising. Uh, Carluccio's went into administration in late March, just a couple of weeks into lockdown. Others followed and others were already in trouble. Debenhams had already started to close stores and John Lewis stated back in February that a number of stores may have to close. I could go on, but the point I'm trying to make is that our retail infrastructure is very fragile. The pandemic has hastened what we already knew was happening to our high streets, the fact that they are changing. In fact, our high streets and our retails have been changing and evolving for 2,000 odd years. There's nothing new here. Retailers are dynamic and innovative. What is probably different right now, as I've stated, is that speed of change. Everything basically happened overnight. You'll recall back in 2011, the then Prime Minister David Cameron appointed Mary Portis to undertake a review into our high streets. Our town centres were too large and had lost their sense of place and purpose, and the internet had arrived. Much was written, but the change from bricks to clicks was definitely underway. And over the last couple of months, whilst we all moan about this, I suspect we're all very grateful that it has been possible to purchase almost whatever we want online. 
Our supermarkets and corner shops have adapted very quickly and efficiently with a supply chain that's coped with very well. Reduced opening hours and store capacity with a few missing products has been accepted. And if you do want to go food shopping, you can. The larger supermarkets have also non-food ranges. And I've watched as m and have found more and more innovative ways to get their customers from the front door to the food, zigzagging through the non-food ranges. However, our high streets are not just about retailing. Their composition is a complex mix of the provision of services, including leisure and food and beverage, which have been hardest hit at present. Opening our shops is reasonably straightforward. Opening the pubs, clubs and theatres is a very different issue, especially while social distancing remains. Before the pandemic, we were imagining what our town centres would be in the future and planning for the latest round of change. Much of the debate at that time was about people and the need for improved public spaces where people could meet and dwell safely. It's probably still a little bit too early to really understand what's happening to the high streets and how that change is going to happen as we start to come out of lockdown. Some shops are beginning to open again, and a common sight is the queues along the pavement outside the baker, the bank and the butcher. The supermarket queue seems to be accepted as here to stay for a while at least. We need to wait and see which shops actually open and those where the lack of trading and financial strain over Q2 has been too much to bear. We then have the question of unsold and potentially unwanted stock. Harrods have recently announced that they will open a pop-up store to help shift this stock, but probably more importantly, to assist with social distancing for their staff and their customers. What we have learned is that retail is resilient and the appetite from operators, owners and the finance houses is huge. I mentioned Carluccio's going under so soon after lockdown and only a month later it was reported that a new owner had been found. The relation therefore between our landlords and our tenants is absolutely vital. Tenants have stated that some landlords are not willing to communicate. Landlords are suggesting that some tenants are taking the opportunity not to pay their rent and other outgoings. The next quarter's rent is due in three weeks' time, and already there is talk of further non-payment and threats of CVA. This affects us all in so many different ways, from the macro, where our pensions are invested in retail property, to the micro, where our local shops are owned and operated by individuals and family trusts. Our shops must communicate with their banks, and especially with their customers. Once a tenant has a problem, it becomes the landlord's problem, and that involves the banks. And it's not just the retail shops, but the support infrastructure from the offices, factories, warehouses, logistics, and the numerous people involved in this retailing process. And I would suggest that the problem is quite different in our towns and villages to that that we experience in our major centers and cities. And the problems are not uniform across the country, and one size does not fit all. The recent accelerated but temporary move to online shopping will influence the composition of our high streets and their recovery will have much to do of our need to interact with other people, our ability to find the products we require and the way in which we will all work in the future. Many of us have been working from home and for some it's been great and for some not so great. For office space workers, we have the technology to work almost anywhere we want. But if you work in retail and leisure, construction, manufacturing, distribution, or within the health or the arts. Working from home is not an option. So is this shift from the office to home going to influence our town centres? Yes, it will, but change takes time, and in time we will adapt to the new ways, long before our ability to change the physical high street. We are returning to the shops already, but many retailers are planning to open again during June, so we need to see how the high street looks in another month or so. Our high streets serve the people, and I suspect that we will all want to return to our town centres as soon as it is safe to do so. Thanks, Anthony. Um, there's some some great threads in there that um, we'll we'll pick out, and, and, and a big one on uh, on the idea that the arts um, in the arts it's not possible to work from home because there's so much activity that's actually going on that's sort of breaking, starting to break through to the surface, and uh, we've got a, a whole series of um, of, of webinars planned to, uh, to to dig at that a, a bit, but um, but some great perspective there. Thank you very much. So, Chris um, uh, at ICC and and Hounslow, how does that picture resonate on on the high streets that you're working on? How how are the councils you're working with 
responding and what challenges do they face in intervening uh, and what measures have they implemented or, or encouraged so far? Thank you, Toby, and morning, everyone. Um, and I just want to say thank you to 3Fox for um, uh, hosting this with us and to the other panellists for, for joining the conversation. So I suppose the first question to answer is that what we think are the, and what we're hearing from councils are the components and challenges are of a successful package of support for high streets. And there's three that I'm going to, to talk about this morning. The first of, it, of which is the need for urgency. Town centres and high streets thrive during the summer and support is needed now. The second is the multifaceted nature of the challenge and therefore the corporate nature of the response required. And the third is the opportunity for councils to make an immediate impact while securing a better future. So on the first one, the need for urgency. More than ever, it's a, a requirement for councils to work at pace um, and draw upon the challenges that require an agile, flexible um, approach in maturing environment, just coming out of all of the work they've been doing on the, uh, to help with the COVID response. So knowing that the work can deliver an immediate boost for the businesses provides a huge motivation for all those teams involved, but also an additional pressure to their already busy schedules. On multifaceted nature of the challenge, there are six areas that we've seen and identified that are required to deliver a comprehensive support to town centres. The first of which is leadership. So preparing a plan, engaging partners, marshalling resources and leading delivery is something that only councils can do. The second is communication. So it needs to be multi-channeled, consistent, inclusive and persuasive to make sure that people feel confident to return to their high streets and confident to go out and shop again when they've been used to online, um, the, the, the convenience of online um, shopping. The third element is rec reclaiming public space. So we all know about social distancing measures on streets and cycle lanes. That's not enough. As Anthony was saying just a minute ago, there's a big challenge for our hospitality businesses, restaurants, bars, and so on in particular restaurants that form such an important part of our high streets and build those social connections beyond the commercial transaction. Councils really need to be bold at the moment. And, are, and if you want to support those hospitality businesses come the summer, they just need additional physical space in which to trade. They need people to sit down at tables and order food and wine. That's the nature of their business. And if they can't do that, takeaway doesn't replace it. So there needs to be additional physical space for those businesses to occupy and serve the customers that would want to come back. The fourth element is regulation. So what can, 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 sorry, what can councils do to temporarily change their planning, licensing, highways and enforcement regulations? And we're, always, we're already seeing this with the work being done across the UK in reclaiming some of those, um, some high streets and roads to allow social distancing to take place. The fifth is investment. So what are the opportunities for quick investment decisions now um, where businesses are struggling, where landlords are seeking um, to secure revenue? What can the councils do now that would also secure a foothold and allow them to create the high street in the medium term? And the sixth one is that of technology. So how can uh, using technology to provide data and measure the performance of those interventions? And by making an immediate impact, the councils can also secure a better future. So by working with their partners, with communities, learning it and about their local businesses and turning those into partnerships, they can build stronger relationships that will have a lasting benefit for their areas. And it will also increase councils understanding of its local business economy and town centers to enable more effective leadership, strategy creation and policy setting in the medium to long term. The work that Hounslow are doing at the moment is they are developing these plans. They are working up detailed plans for their four principal town centres and their other important shopping areas. They've acted quickly to prepare proposals for highways adaptations. Um, and like, but unlike other councils, are facing a challenge of operating at pace 
with lower financial resources having just come out of the COVID response. Great stuff, Chris. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm just about to, to launch a series of uh, little mini polls inside this webinar, so they'll appear on your screen. Um, and, and viewers, if you can just uh, vote, they're mostly sort of yes or no's, um, then we'll make sure that your responses are sort of used in the, in the report that follows this, uh, this, this session. Uh, and it might feed some of the discussion that's coming up in, in, uh, in a few minutes. So that's uh, hitting your screens now. Um, and back to the um, panel, Louise, um, we've heard a little bit about, about what's happening in London. In what ways is the picture different in the high streets of Cornwall? What's the perspective, not just from a non-London council, but a council that's balancing that dynamic tension between local residents and the essential but not always welcome tourists who, who might bring viruses as well as revenue streams? Thanks, Toby. So, hi, my name's Louise Woods and I'm, I'm Director for Planning at Corn Council. Um, and I think you might think that Cornwall's a small rural place, um, but in fact we are one of the biggest um, planning authorities in the UK. So um, we determine more planning applications every year than London boroughs. So it just gives you an idea of the scale of, of where we are and how we act. Um, so I'm sat in my shed in sunny Cornwall, um, working from home, lucky to live in a great place, can't really fault it. The sea is our neighbour, um, no inland places are more than about 20 miles from it. So it gives you a flavour of the sort of place that we are, I think, really. And the challenges that we face, are, you know, they're not particularly different, are they, to other high streets around the country, but they are exacerbated by our particular circumstances. So that fact that we are a rural place with a large number of stuff happening, but lots of places over a big area gives us a unique challenge. We're very remote. We're at a peninsula, we're at the end of the country, and we've got that remoteness to deal with. Um, low um, average wages, um, and seasonality of tourism, as you say. So in fact, um, when I was looking at some stats just to think about um, accommodation and food services contribute to about 16% of our employment. So it's a massive impact um, on our sectors really. Um, and in high street terms, actually that has an impact as well because our inland market towns, they have to compete, don't they, with those really popular seaside foodie towns. So your Foy's, um, Padstow, Porth Leven, we can think of, I can think of loads more. You know, those are those places where you can go and eat by the sea, can't you? You can eat, look at the sea and visit the beach. So some of our places, we've got this kind of unique competition happening in places. So some of our high streets, not only struggling with all the things that they're struggling with in terms of the internet and all those things, but they're struggling with competing against their kind of maybe more scenic partners um, in that respect, really. Um, and I think we see that really in terms of thinking about recovery. So Penzance, one of our um, vibrant places, um, Non-grocery sales are down 89%. So that's a really astonishing impact, isn't it? And recovery, um, you'd think that we'd be grappling, wouldn't we, for that tourism to be back and that recovery to happen. But it's really tempered by um, the concerns of our community about only having one hospital. So a very limited number of acute intensive care beds. And I think it's understandable, isn't it, for, for people to be fearful for both their health and livelihoods. And we have places um, which have a very, um, have an older population, and people are concerned about the impact that will have on a number of visitors coming to Cornwall. So a doubling of our population over summer, summer times at the moment just seems like an incredible thing to be able to cope with. Um, and I don't think that any of us would want people to be here where they didn't feel welcome, where they couldn't access facilities, or that we had a kind of COVID hotspot flare up and people had to go home. So it's a real challenge for us, I think, in this season. How do we deal with this season and with all those challenges ahead? And how do we do that as well by making longer term plans for what's going to happen in all those places? Um, and how we're going to make those places relevant and how the council is going to help facilitate that over so many places. So we're not in that um, respect of having a couple of high streets. We've got 20 market towns and another prefer of big seaside villages and things that we have to support. So I think for us in Cornwall, it really becomes quite paramount that the community voice is paramount in that. And we actively pursue a place-based way of working. So our approach to service delivery, whether that's through um, the planning teams and I've got area teams that work out in communities, or three, we have community link officers that work with places and they work to bring those places together and establish the vision for how they'll go forward. Um, and that kind of follows through to our immediate response to what we're doing in terms of social distancing um, in our places where we are taking the approach of saying that we trust our communities to do what's right for the areas. We trust the businesses and the communities to do that. Um, and we're leading the way by actively removing barriers. So some of those things Chris is talking about in terms of regulation, you know, actively saying to people, go out, make some signs, put some tapes on the ground, 
um, use some planters, we won't enforce tables and chairs, we'll under enforce in terms of planning permission, get on with it, you can do it this season, that's fine. Um, and producing a toolkit really to set that out so that people have the confidence that they can do that because we've said it and we've written it on our website. So we're kind of taking that approach and that kind of smaller intervention is let get out the way and let people do what they need to do and trust them to do it. Um, but then to focus our time and resource really on those bigger places and to do that where places have a plan because we haven't got time to arbitrate between factions so we're going to work with willing and we're going to do the interventions where um, they're most wanted and that, that's pursued with us and I think that builds on the practice that we see already so Penzance I talked about a bit, bit earlier about how it's, it's struggling but you know it's a really good example of a place with a real vision and a drive to deliver um, it was awarded the town of the year by the Academy of Urbanism Awards for 2020 so it just gives you an example of its ambition really um, and they're really aware that they need to move their high streets to focus on retail to community hubs. So they know about and they want to drive and they are driving pop-up uses. Um, there's a big um, creative um, hub project um, that's being supported hopefully by European funding uh, coming forward. Community facilities, employment and definitely more residential. So I think we you know, we know we have to get used to a higher turnover of uses on our high streets and we have to get used to different types of uses on our high streets and a retraction. And I think, you know, I, I'd admit completely that the planning system is outdated really in that respect. Um, and it's something that us as a profession need to grapple with because we don't do speed very well, if we're honest, especially in policy terms. Um, and, you know, high streets are not going to wait um, for five years while the planning um, system tries to get its act in order. So we've got to try and find better ways to do that and better ways to do that quicker. Um, so I think just for us, then the short term, we've got to manage that transition back to tourism really carefully. And do that with our communities, do it collaboratively. Uh, we've got a plan for retail attraction, conversion, redevelopment of the uses. Um, and I think a uh, point that Chris brought up as well, I definitely think we're seeing a move towards not seeing things in bricks and mortar. So public realm to facilitate those pop-up uses in the hearts of our places becomes really fundamental. So what we've been seeing in Cornwall, I think over the last um, lockdown period, you know, we've got bread vans, uh, quirky bread vans doing deliveries to 20 villages. Um, every week. We've got pop-up horse boxes serving with fried pizza. We've got all sorts of really exciting things happening which can make our towns really vibrant. So we need to really, really hold on to that and promote it and have the space to do that because you're right, you, need, you can't do that without a decent space and a decent place. Um, and we do need to help ourselves. So, you know, councils, we're getting some funding from government, high street funds and all those things. That's brilliant, but it's only going to help some of our places. We've got loads of places. We've got to help ourselves. Um, our council um, did an inquiry into high streets last year and we've got a four million pound pot um, that's just coming to fruition now and that will enable places to bid into that so you know some could say that's really fortuitous we got lucky but we're on the front foot uh, we've got an investment company that the council set up she's doing its own investment so they're looking at places on the high street um, we as a planning authority have got um, community infrastructure levy funds and we're hoping to do a bidding round into that in the autumn that places can bid into for infrastructure to help in the longer term um, and we are looking at how we can revise our planning policy to make it more flexible, really. So it's about flexibility. I, I really think it's about flexibility in that space, but I do think we need to drive quality. What we don't want to see um, is inappropriate uses next to, next to each other, um, a lack of um, decent quality housing in those high streets. We really need to drive the quality in there so that they become places where people want to live. So I think that's it from me. Thank you. Fantastic, Louise. That's, that's a great roundup of a, a really intense period of activity, it sounds like. Although I did have the sort of horrific image um, placed in my mind there of a, of a horse pizza, um, which is <laughs> not appropriate for breakfast at all. No. <laughs> but no. Thanks but for it's the... very, it is very good pizza, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, hopefully it's, um, it's, a, it's an idea that will spread because um, uh, uh, delivered pizzas, good quality pizzas, is nothing, nothing quite so uh, attractive at the end of the day um, uh, as uh, maybe a beer. A beer and a pizza. If you could get that into a horse van, I'd be very happy, man. That would be better. Yeah. Dan, Dan yeah. as a um, at, at Souk Space, as an innovative retailer, that's how you, that's how you've been built. So, um, so are you are you looking at pizzas and beers in in horse boxes? Um, oh. <laughs> and what, what what positive changes are you seeing in in, in retail in in terms of um, in terms of retail in terms of the the support you're getting and the intervention that's being made on your behalf or to make things easier for you? And, and what does retail look? look like uh, as, we, as we move forward what are the implications for our, for our high streets yeah so hello everyone um yes yeah, so i'm dan from from souk just a tiny bit of context as to what we do because uh, it'll make uh, my response make a bit more sense so we we our innovation is that we we offer space as a service so we take over high street spaces 
uh, we give tenants, uh, retailers, all the tools they need to be able to create their spaces, whether they're selling stuff or using them for events, uh, and people can borrow the space for as short as an hour. Um, and that's, that's how we operate. Uh, along with that, you can also rent staff as a service and uh, get all the analytics you need to know how your space is done. But on the on the positive changes that we're seeing, um, certainly at Souk, we have seen uh, a dramatic change in the attitudes of retailers, um, where things might have been quite difficult for organisations like us in the past. Uh, we've noticed a, a sea change uh, in their attitude. So, for example as i said our spaces can have a different tenant in up to every hour of the day um, i fully appreciate how that could be quite scary uh, especially if you're a traditional uh, historically more risk adverse organization uh, but this is actually starting to be embraced by the landlords that we're dealing with um, not only is the the way of working and this this model being embraced we're also seeing as a not that we are strictly speaking a retailer but we're seeing that the, the, the landlords are also accepting of different commercial arrangements. So with some of our landlords, we're not actually paying currently any rent or any rates. Um, we are entering into different arrangements with the landlords. We're entering into revenue sharing arrangements. So that's certainly certainly very positive support. And it's, it's fantastic for both the retailers, people like us, and the landlords because it's it's allowing us to build that momentum and build that footfall so some of the shopping centers that were in even pre-covid were that were struggling uh by having this arrangement we were actually one of the drivers of footfall to these shopping centers and without the, the landlords doing this innovation with us uh, we we wouldn't have been able to to drive that and then as for as for retail going towards 2021 uh i think I think strangely 2021 might be a, a good year for the shopper. Um, I think it might be quite an exciting time. I think exciting brands will win over average, average brands, if I, can, if I can put it like that. I think 2021, we might see more of a move of independent brands back to the high street, especially if the barriers to entry do become less, especially if units become more, more accessible. Um, we're also seeing a bit of a trend in not just the online, uh, not just the independent brands perhaps coming back, but we've seen a lot of, we've been approached by quite a few online brands, which have always been traditionally online only. We, we don't have physical space, but wanting to take our space, uh, take our spaces. And that's, it, it's interesting. Everyone's got different motivations, but we think people will dip their toe in the water. They might not want full-time retail, but they're wanting to try stuff. They're wanting to have an event they're wanting to get signups for their online platform but they're using the physical retail space to do that uh, and we think we might see a, an evolution of perhaps moving from digitally native brands doing pop-ups to things such as amazon uh, clicks and mortar so amazon uh, and their marketplace sellers will take a shop somewhere they'll rent it for a space of time and it will have a different uh, different tenant in every day so we, we, we think there might be a little bit more of that and clicks and mortar sort of events might become more prevalent. Um, we do actually think uh, that the, the high streets will, will contract, but as I said, um, this will lead to, to more interesting places to visit. Um, physical high streets will and need to exist. We describe them ourselves internally as the original social network, like that, that is what a, a high street is. It's where you go to buy and do stuff um that they need to exist more than ever they need to exist but i think people on retailers on the high street need to ensure their strategies and this is a little bit 101 but it, it's good to i think it will be even more important now that retailers strategy is driven by pulling customers in uh which as it always should be but it will be the ones which are build it and they will come and buy it will find it harder and harder and harder um there's a term which we use, uh, which not use, which is being, uh, we're hearing banded around a lot more uh, for certain uh, retailers on the high street. It's instead of ROI, people are saying ROE, uh, return on event, return on experience. Um, and it's the appreciation of having a high street space to do something, 
has greater benefits than necessarily just selling 20 things in a day. Um, and it's being able to track that. And then I think finally, we, we think that physical retailers on high streets will look to take more and more learnings from the online world to the bricks and mortar world. So for example, now, or online, you see you can track conversions. You know how many visitors have gone to your website. You know how many people have looked at stuff. And then you've got the hard data of the sales at the checkout. We think that the analytics will evolve in the physical space. So not only will you have transaction data, but as an example, in our spaces, we know how many people walk past. We know how many are men, how many are women. We know how many have walked in. We know whereabouts in the shop people are dwelling loitering going to and doing uh, and we're not doing it ourselves yet but we know of others that are, um, whether we do or not is a is a question we have to ask ourselves what do we think it's right to do but we know that other retailers are looking at being able to tell if a customer is in their shop uh, because of big brother um, what where have they been before and when have they been after because of the tracking on a, on a phone. So where a, where a cookie can perhaps track you around the internet and a retailer can tell that you've come from one site or another, we think uh, physical retailers in the future as well from now will start to, start to try and exploit this data to tell, oh, look, everyone in, I don't know, Penzance or a nice place in Cornwall uh, went to John Lewis this morning and they're off to Primark this afternoon. And what could that tell you about your customer and how might you be able to target your experience based on Tuesday morning is full of Primark shoppers and Thursday afternoon is full of John Lewis shoppers and, and going from there. No, it's, it's, it's fascinating stuff. I try not to be um, creeped out by, by that sort of, uh, that sort of stuff then for every, I find that for every person who says that um, they're really worried about that sort of level of, um, uh, intrusion in, into their lives and the monitoring uh, levels. There's someone else who says, isn't it great that there's someone out there who knows exactly what I want and keeps trying to give it to me. Um, mm. So, so the, I guess that, that that's a much wider conversation and probably beyond the, the remit of, uh, of, of this morning, but thank I'd you very it. much for, for those insights. That's really useful. And um, lots of questions in, coming through into my mind about the sorts of place that are suitable for your kind of operation. What, what makes you go to one place and not another? How can local authorities um, make it easy for you? Uh, to mm. set up and, and operators like you um, that we can dig into you later. And viewers, mm. if, if you've got questions, please do um, pile them into the, the Q&A function so that other viewers can vote for them and we can end up with uh, the most popular questions, which we can put to the panel in just about sort of five or six minutes. But before we do that, and um, before he runs out of, uh, of caffeine, <laughs> we, need to, we need to go to Kevin in the city of Stewart in Florida, USA, where um, I guess um, getting, getting footfall on the high streets is a slightly different kind of issue uh, right now um, with, with what's happening there. Not, I'm not trying to make, make light of no. the situation. Yeah. But, yeah. but perhaps um, more broadly, if you, can, if you can look beyond that and look at how, how the responses have been different in the US to, to COVID on, on the high street uh, yeah. and where because less regulation applies and, and what models of resilience there might be that you've, you've seen that could be adapted to the UK possibly. Well, yeah, thanks, Toby. Um, and thanks for everybody out there who um, is actually sitting there and looking at me from, you know, this place in the, in the States and what, what can I actually offer you know, in advice to the UK in terms of you know listening for somebody who's living and working in the States and people often say to me you know what well you know what's it like over there and my first answer is well it's the same but it's different and that you can apply that to the way that the pandemic's been approached here um, our lockdown's been approached here and the idea of how the resilience can be put in place and the autonomy of local government and how that's worked in terms of benefit in terms of the pace of response and chris talked about the pace of response being really vital in how local governments react to this situation um, so that we're in a situation where the high street in the us is in a lot of respects, fundamentally different to the high street in the UK. Because if you look at the timeline of the development of high streets in the UK, we went through a period of pedestrianization, um, encouraging stores to be in town centers, 
and that's really not happened in the US. We've we've stick we've stuck with um, having the car, having the vehicle as the main point of contact between the consumer and the high street. And so, in a way, that for a long time, people like myself have always been you know fighting to pedestrianise, close down the shopping centres or shopping high streets and get more footfall in there because that was out you know that made sense more footfall more business more activity more social gathering and a better more vibrant town center but not having that and it's become apparent and i've changed my view on this to a certain extent which is quite surprising that having a primarily vehicular based high street has actually helped our response and and to be more flexible now what I'm going to do, I'm going to try and share my screen, Toby, um, and see if I can pull this up. Let me see. Yes, I think I can do that. So can everybody see that? All good. So that is a that's a that's a typical baseline of a high street in America. We see the the sidewalk or pavement. Um, and then vehicles actually coming and driving and consumers coming and driving right up to the store front and doing business in that way. Now, in a way, you don't really want to see that in a high street. But as I'm going to move through these slides, you're going to see how that has actually helped the decision-making process and also the, the local ability to change regulation very quickly, to put in a... Um, state of emergency and say we're going to overwrite every planning rule that applies to this city and that's a city on city basis so you can do that do this in any town in in the states so the city manager took the point of view let's let's just wipe out certain planning regulations and let's just go for it so you know myself and my team came up with ideas of how we would implement more activity on the street in terms of social distancing and in terms of getting consumers actually interacting with the businesses. Now we already had a program, and this was part of the desire to get more pedestrians on the street, a program of converting parking spaces to outdoor seating. And this is one example where we, as a city, we offered a license agreement with the retailer to say, you know, we will lease you a piece of public right of way to, so you can put out an outdoor seating area. And that was done through the town. It was fairly limited. And we had a number of things going on in the high street that started that movement. But now these are being converted to be more able to be socially distanced facilities. So when we, you know, we spoke to the politicians here, we said, look, we need, we need to remove the restrictions, all the restrictions on using parking areas and convert them to outdoor seating areas as far as possible. And at that moment in time, I was actually promoting the closure of the whole street. But that didn't, that was sort of debated by the retailers and the uh, restaurants on that street. And we came to a, a sort of a middle ground where we would allow conversion of the, the parking spaces, but still maintain the, the street being open. I wanted to remove all barriers to allowing structures to be put into these areas, to allow signage for retails and restaurants to actually go out there and promote the, that they were still open. Um, and there were, some, there were state restrictions on the use of internal space, which actually was driving people to need more external space. And this was a, a good solution, we thought, that we could apply. But we also said, look, we've got public spaces, parks, plazas, small areas, walking areas around the, this commercial area. And we wanted that to be available for restaurant use, particularly. We also put out, promoted how people could convert parking spaces and put tables and distance themselves within those parking areas. So we gave some advice to restaurants and other places that could say, look, this is what we're doing, help us out. We want to encourage you to get back on the street. We want you to show. We want to show you that the regulations are being um, 
reduced or removed and we want to help you continue business in terms of the the lockdown that you're facing and the restriction on your business and using internal floor space so we now see on the same street that we had photos of earlier that restaurants have come out onto the street they made their own little structures they've set out their own table areas and they've set out a barrier where actually vehicles can still travel past um, where people can actually sit out socially distance and enjoy the high street we're maintaining footfall it's not as big as it, as it could be but we're, we're still maintaining a presence on that street from the consumer we also have not only on the high street we also have individual um, stores or shops within what we'd call a typical strip plaza in in the states and we've encouraged those to also look at their parking areas and push into those um, and normally in the states you would have regulations to say each store has an x amount of parking spaces associated with it, and that would part, be part of the, the zoning regulations to do that but we've we've said that doesn't apply anymore get out and use those spaces this is a, an example of a public space a public space that um, we suggested could be used by an adjacent restaurant and what's important here is that the sphere of influence of the where the consumer can be to where the activity is it has to be close to the point of sale it has to be relevant and it has to be associative to the use that we're seeing we also because of the vehicle and this is what this is what changed my mind a lot of people were ordering online direct to stores and they weren't visiting the stores per se they were ordering online ordering it to be delivered to the store going to the store and picking it up in their car and so we reserved allowed the re reservation of parking for storefront pickup and so you know my conclusion to all of this and this is applicable i think to anywhere not just the states this is applicable to anywhere we have to analyze the high street in terms of its business uses what is, or what is the makeup of the high street what is the future makeup of the high street now we've gone we've gone through a really the, the stress test of the 21st century. We've been pushed into the 21st century. A lot of things that have happened within this two or three months, I think we're gonna happen anyway to the retail sector. I think we're gonna happen to the great hope of the high street, the restaurant spaces. And I think that the leisure and culture sector may be our savior for the high street. They're the outdoor activities that are going to attract people back into the high street. And we need to maintain the spaces to pull those activities back in. That's the activity now where we've devolved this stress through. And I say that the, the five year change has happened. We were going to be here in five years time. But we have to embrace it. We have to say what's happening to the high, high street. How can we help? we need to look at the, the sphere of influence of those businesses and how we can maintain that public land use within that sphere of influence. That's some, the, some consumer, the consumer point of action, interaction is you know, part of that also. And again, it was mentioned by another, another speaker, Toby, the, the logistics and the safety and access mm -hmm. uh, are all important things. And, and that's where I think a lot of pedestrianized areas are gonna struggle in making the decision point to allow more access into those pedestrian Irish areas. So in conclusion, that's, that's what we're doing here. Um, we're very, as I say, we're acting at pace. We really are um, thinking all the time, every day to analyze and, uh, and discuss what's going on and see if we can make another movement to help businesses. That's some really interesting insight, um, Kevin. Thanks, thanks very much indeed for that, and and um, and lots of food for thought. Um, I, I noticed yesterday the chief exec at um, at Liverpool City Council was talking about some similar interventions to you, but his his angle on that was that um, the the city had learnt a lot from its time as city of culture, which I think was two thousand and eight. Yeah. 
where hospitality had really boomed and they'd used hospitality to kind of drive a real, real visitor um, uh, economy. Um, and that they were starting uh, now again to look at the public space um, being taken over by, by, by retail use uh, to make up for the loss of covers inside, but that that was being treated as an event so every night, every evening in Liverpool is an event on the high street. Yeah. Um, and I, I thought that's quite an interesting insight and, and connected up with what Dan was saying earlier about the return on event, return on experience. So there's this kind of this new way of looking at our high streets as venues in, in, in effect yes. um, for, for those experiences. Um, and and there's a whole new sort of string of thinking that, that might come out of that. But one thing that was really clear from what you were saying, Kevin, is, is that need to analyze all the time what's actually happening. Uh, and I wonder, one of the questions from, from uh, one of our viewers um, is whether we feel that um, councils have enough data, enough information at the moment. Um, and I'm gonna put this question to you, Anthony, in, in the first instance. Do you feel that councils have enough data, there is enough inf information and understanding about the high street in order to be able to make um, some of these sorts of interventions? It's it's linked, it's not as simple as straightforward. Nothing is ever as simple as straightforward. Um, one has to bring ownership and fragmented ownership into the debate as well. Uh, and the influence uh, that a local authority has uh, on its own town centres, uh, in many respects, is, is actually linked to how much that town centre it actually owns. Um, fragmented ownership, as I say, is, is probably one of the biggest problems that we have in terms of being able to adapt and change. Um, Trying to get people to actually work together uh, is, is not as straightforward and as simple as it sounds. Um, in terms of data collection, um, one of the things that came out when we did the, um, um, the, the, the town centre uh, work back in 2011 was a great assumption from the general public that all town centres were owned by the local authorities. Um, now that's kind of nice in one respect, but in another respect it, it's not so good because therefore they get blamed for everything as well. Um, it doesn't matter what happens. If, it, if it's good, no one thanks you. But if something goes wrong, all of a sudden it, it is a local authority's problem. Um, the ability, um, I want to talk about the ability to collect data. What I'll talk about is, is the fact that they don't have the data that they actually need to make some of those decisions. Um, town centre working groups, LEPs, uh, town centre management, uh, all these things have helped over the years. But it's still very, very different across the country. Uh, for every example you get of an excellent uh, cooperation between uh, government, let's just use that term, uh, and especially the private sector, um, there's another experience of where it just doesn't work at all. Uh, it's what I said a few minutes ago about, you know, everywhere is different and it's not one size fits all. Um, one thing that I would put into all of this is it's also not a competition. Um, uh, we're all in this. For, for the first time in many, many years, the problem that we are experiencing is absolutely the same no matter where you are. And, and Kevin's description of what was going on in, in Florida, I mean, these are exactly the same issues that we're debating over here. I think for the first time in our history where we have got a problem, as I say, it is absolutely identical. And we should be learning from those experiences. Um, whilst one size doesn't fit all, best practice actually is, is a decent place to start. Um, but that I mean, we've been talking about the collection of data. It's interesting what Dan was saying about, you know, you know, how many people come into the shop, where they're doing, how many minutes they've spent there, potentially even what they picked up and what they put down. Um, we were looking at technology 10, 12, 13, 14 years ago uh, to put into shopping centres that gave tenants the ability to actually target you as you walked in, because through the, the mobile phone that you've got, as you're walking past one of the shops, you could be bombarded, if that's the right term, with coming to the shop in the next 15 minutes and I'll give you 20% off. Now, that kind of ability to influence the way that people move around town centres and shopping centres is massive because you were going to go, I'll pick up the, the, the Primark and John Lewis uh, example that we were talking about uh, just a moment ago, but you were going to go to John Lewis, but, but Primark texts you and you think, oh, I'll go to Primark first of all. It, it takes quite a lot of decision-making away but what we did find was all this data was almost instantaneous, but no one was actually capturing it. Now, that was 10 years ago. Now, when we asked the question, we asked the question of shopping centre owners, they kind of said, well, it's not that much use to us. Local authorities were saying, we don't know what to do with it, and we don't have the resource 
to actually manage this amount of data. This is huge amounts of data that we're talking about, and I'm not sure who's got the resources to actually manage it. But to ask the question, uh, are, do they have the data? No, and are they using it? Not enough. Thanks, Anthony. Louise, how does that resonate with you and your, your experience in Cornwall? Do you feel you're getting access to the data that you need? Do you feel that, 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 that there needs to be uh, some sort of change in that, in that area? No, I think I'd agree. I mean, we, the, our, our difficulty is we tend to have a lot of data, um, a lot of data stuck in, um, often in PDF reports, difficult to manipulate, difficult to use. We're not well versed necessarily in using that data and we don't have the resource or skills to do it. Um, all the funds to resource what we need to do. So, um, yes, we have we have lots of data. We're getting better. Um, I've got a very techy, great guy who does some whizzy things that um, I don't know what he's doing, but um, it gives me some great information and it's really useful. But that's the kind of exception rather than the norm. So I think it's just the local authorities just struggling with that. It's capacity, resources, um, knowledge of how to do that, and and a bit of that thing where you know we've got so much stuff like you said where do you start how do you rationalize it how do you know what's useful how do you know what the best stuff to collect is so um yeah i think it's not something that i would say is our key strength in all areas mm. fantastic Thank, thanks Louise. Uh, uh, i i'm sure that that's um, that's true for for large swathes of uh, of, of the country dan if i can come to you feel free to pick up on on that thread but also yeah. another thing that the, the viewers are interested in asking and and, and me as well is um about how local authorities can make it easier for, for an operator such as yourself um, to, to, to set up in business and, and what they have to do to, uh, to attract you. Yeah, certainly. So first of all, on the, on the data point, um, it's really interesting. So we, we have our offering for our tenants. Um, we, we either offer our tenants the data. Uh, the data could be real time, someone will pass, someone will pass. But what we're trying to do is add more and more value to, to what we can offer. So uh, we have data and then we have analytics, which is instead of just saying someone walked past, we say, oh, 10,000 people walked past on a Tuesday morning in London. And then we, we try and add more value to it by insight. Oh, actually, 8,000 of those 10,000 walked past before your opening hours, maybe open an hour earlier. We, we have had some local authorities come to us with exactly that saying, oh, can, can we have this data? And then we're like, yeah, absolutely, it's great. Um, but then it's, it's how do we give it to local authorities? And that's just what we're working at. Do you want the raw data in the spreadsheets and you can do your own analytics and insight? Or is that something that a company such as ourselves or someone we partner with would add that analytics, add that insight on top of it and then, and then pass it on? Um, as for the, the local authorities, um, so I'm going to caveat this with I'm, I am the techie. I'm not, I'm not my co-founder is the, the former property developer. Uh, but for us, um, so our shops, our shops have a yoga studio in there between seven and nine in the morning. They will be a retailer during the day and they will be an event at the end. Uh, and it, it's, it's usage. It's um, my people talk about, Oh, this, this unit is of, uh, it's got an A1 usage, so therefore we can't do more than 15% of the time this, that, or the other. Um, that I think that would be the that would be the area to target to bring life back to certain high streets. That would be the biggest bang for buck. If if you know that you, your shops are rammed on the Saturday, the Sunday, the Friday, why not do things to allow them to be busy on the on the Monday morning? Uh, we've in one of our shops generated a new peak on a Tuesday night where the community borrow it and the community use it for really cool stuff. And you could argue, oh, if town halls were still prominent, they would, people could just use that. But actually, no, people are using it for gigs. They're using it for discussions, for interviews, for photography lessons. And that's not retail, but they're using the retail space for it. So yeah, to answer your question, I think it would be uh, usage. Fantastic. Thanks, Dan. Um, Chris, coming to you. So, so feel, again, feel free to, to pick up on any of the threads that, um, that the panel have been discussing so far. But also, perhaps the, there's a piece in there that, that Dan was talking about, sort of uh, uh, a planning use, in effect. Um, there's also something in there about values, isn't there? I mean, what's, what's happening to uh, property values on, on the high street? Um, and, and what's happening with the relationship between retail and, and landlords? Is, is there something new emerging there or, or is that, that something that was already happening? Or do you think it's something that's very temporary and, and, and won't endure anyway? 
Thanks, Toby. And, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll let Anthony pick up on a point on, on values. He's probably more equipped to do that. But just building a point on data, I think, you know, I've attended quite a few webinars at a, a significant amount of discussions with councils recently and there is a, a growing appreciation of the need to make data and evidence-based decisions um, out of uh, coming out of the pandemic and I think we've all been sheep dipped haven't we in data on a daily basis by the government so I think its prominence in decision making is, 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 is grown as a result of that I think it's about turning data and this is Dan's point it's turning data into actionable intelligence that turns into intervention because if you've just got data there's almost no point having it yeah and so what what what's coming out of this and what's informing the work that Hounslow are doing is a business survey that they've launched that's reaching out to all of their businesses including their high street businesses and asking them about the types of intervention or what their sentiment is what their the level of resilience is what their outlook is but asking them about the their types of interventions that would enable them to continue trading during these difficult few months. And as a result of understanding that, then you can tailor the interventions with a greater degree of certainty that the resources are being uh, deployed in an effective way. Great stuff. Thanks, Chris. Anthony, do you want to pick up on, on property uses and, and values and what you're seeing? We don't really have enough time to go into the, um, <laughs> the technical side. Uh, there are, I mean, there, there, I guess there are a number of answers to that, that in, in value terms, uh, the, the rent that is stated in the lease is still the rent that's stated in the lease until such time as, as something's actually changed. I think there are, an all man, there are all number of short-term discussions going on at the moment, from the very high-profile travel lodge discussion uh, that's going on with all their landlords to individual landlords and their tenants, being quite sensible in terms of uh, delaying rent, giving extra time at the end of the lease, basically just cutting out a quarter and starting again. All this will have an effect on value, but by the time we probably understand that, we'll be in the next phase of, of this journey that we're on anyway. So I think the value question is very difficult and, and probably is worth um, a, about a three hour seminar all, all on its own. Um, what I would just very quickly, because I'm, I'm conscious of the time here, is, is pick up. Um, we've talked generally about what's going on in our, in our town centres. And, and Dan especially has, has kind of talked about Monday mornings as well as, as kind of Tuesday evenings and everything else. And the evening economy um, is, is that area of, of a number of our town centres that we've been working on over the last few years to try and grow the economy. And you can either grow it through increased sales or you can grow it through extended time periods. Still too many of our shops in our town centres kind of close at five o'clock. With this new way of working which we're all going to have which potentially doesn't mean we're working nine till five we may be working three o'clock in the morning till midday i mean who knows what that might be but the rest of the the world has got to kind of change with the way in which our, our work habits are changing as well yeah um, i'm not suggesting it's a 24-hour uh, town center and high street that, that's not going to be possible but we need to be looking at ways in which we can adapt yeah. picking up on kevin's point very quickly just about accessibility um, we're talking about, you know, a bit scared to go back to the shops, a bit scared to go back to the town centres. Well, a bit scared to go on public transport as well, which means that the, the, the private cars kind of, unfortunately, its prominence is being raised as an important tool to actually get us back moving again in the short term. So I agree completely that pedestrianisation is kind of, that, that's a little bit complicated. We know quite a lot of the county councils at the moment are pushing for extra pedestrianisation and taking away. Yeah. the 20 minute or 30 minute free car parking space in the town centers yeah. i'd urge everyone just to have a quick look at that uh, at the moment and one of my pet kind of subjects um and it wouldn't be me if i didn't raise the car park uh, at some point during uh, one of the discussions that i have about our town centers um our, our car parks are absolutely vital um in terms of accessibility into the town center whether you can drive to the to the, uh, the restaurant and pick up your meal or whether you actually want to park and walk up and down the street. Um, and we've got to be looking at, at that total package. It's not just one little thing. It's not about opening slightly differently. It's not about using data. It's actually understanding what our journey is going to be from start to finish in the future, not the way that it was 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago.
No, I think I think that's very wise, Anthony, um, and, and, and helpful helpful comment. Um, and Kevin, um, I, I'm sure that sort of resonates with you. Although you know the parking the parking modes are, are slightly different um, where you are now. But um, <laughs> just another small point, just as we wind up, um, we heard a little bit from Louise about the levels of investment um, that are available to her. Um, what what kind of level of investment are you talking about that are behind the initiatives that that, um, that you introduced us to earlier? Really, it was it was. Um, the, the, the decision making um, we wanted to put uh, discuss you know what sort of uh, revenues or capital investments we we could put into this but we found that businesses were so willing and, and wanting to get out there that we didn't really have to do much one of the proposals was that you know the city themselves went out and built these areas in the in the parking areas we didn't need to do that um, giving the business giving businesses the opportunity to act for themselves um, is far by far the best way of achieving a positive result it's very difficult to force a solution on a high street uh, and i think we want to just be if we deregulate we can let the market and that's my view here we let the market adjust itself um, it's a huge adjustment and, and these, these businesses are discovering that they have customers online. They are discovering that people are more able to visit them in a, in a car. They are discovering that people, even in, the, in the, even in the heat of Florida, are willing to sit outside rather than sit at home. Yeah. Yeah, uh, lot, lots, lots to discover. Yeah. And, and um, I've been very cheeky with, uh, with your time. I've just discovered, uh, having failed to look, we're, we're a minute over. I'm very sorry to use up more of your time than, than I promised. And also to the viewers who've been very patient and I, I hope very uh, interested in, in, uh, in what the panel have been saying. It's been a fantastic contribution from, from you and uh, Kevin. Thank you so much for staying up so late for us. Um, I hope you're off to, to dance the rest of the night away now. Um, I'm going back to sleep, Toby. That's it for me now. <laughs> and thank you to, to the rest of our panel as well for giving us so much uh, food for thought. Uh, there's virtual applause rippling out across the breakfast tables of the nation, I'm sure, um, for, your, for your contributions this morning as our audience gets ready for uh, their daily commute, which um, may be uh, as far as the other side of the table. Um, this is, uh, there's clearly loads more ground to cover uh, on this topic and we'll be doing that at the same time next week when we're back again within a circle and another superb roster of uh, guest speakers to look at uh, changes to regulations to facilitate activity, investment options, funds, capital investment, utilising data sources to inform decision making and much more, I'm sure, whatever we can cram into an hour for you. Um, in the meantime, uh, thanks again to our partner Inner Circle Consulting, whose wealth of experience has made this session possible. Thank you to viewers uh, for your attention and your fascinating and probing questions. We will be dealing with a number of those um, over social media in the, in the coming days. So don't worry if you've asked something that wasn't answered, we'll put it to the panel after this session. You'll find a recording um, of this session and a report at uh, the voiceofauthority.co.uk uh, and through social media tomorrow, uh, along with lots of fascinating interviews with top people at councils. Our next ser session this week is on Thursday at 11 when we're asking what roles will the public sector play in restarting and growing the house building program. Um, but uh, until then, it's goodbye from our panel, uh, goodbye from me and goodbye from everyone at Three Fox. Thank you very much and have a good day. <laughs>